action. Cats, bye bye. Hi, welcome to our new blog. This time, we thought we'd talk a little bit about 3D. Get a good look at your uh, opening uh, shot. Uh, yeah, OK, there you go. Just arm in a little closer. Just watch your back. Hi, I'm Angus. Welcome to the world of 3D. Shooting The Hobbit in 3D is a dream come true. I mean, if I had the ability to shoot Lord of the Rings in 3D, I certainly would have done it. What I actually did on The Lord of the Rings is I had a 3D camera taking 3D photographs Hopefully, one day, maybe even on 3D Blu-ray, we might be able to actually show you some of the 3D photos from 10 or 12 years ago. 3D and I've got reading glasses. It's all, all good. But now, the reality is that it's not that difficult to shoot in 3D. I love it when a film draws you in and you become part of the experience. And 3D helps immerse you in the film. But the essence of our camera system is a camera called the Red Epic. Really, it's this thing that enables us to shoot 3D on The Hobbit. But of course, to shoot 3D, you actually need two cameras. The problem that we have in, in the cinema world is that the lenses that we use are so large that we cannot get an interocular similar to a human's, which is the separation between your eyes. For us to get the two cameras as close together as possible, they have to shoot into a mirror. We have to use a mirror system, which is a rig that's designed by a company called Threality. One's left eye, one's the right eye. One shoots through a mirror, the other one bounces off a mirror, and so the two images are perfectly overlaid. With using two eyes, we can move the cameras apart, and also, more importantly, is find a convergence point. For example, see around someone's face, just like you're looking at a friend. The convergence point is the screen plane itself. 3D forms two places, the positive space, which is inside the box, what you see behind the person who's standing on the screen, and negative space, which is what you feel comes out into the audience, an arm, a bullet, or whatever you want. And the whole idea with these rigs is you can change the interocular and the convergence as we're shooting. We can see that separation on a 2D screen with a left and a right eye overlay. So we can do this live throughout a shot, changing our 3D effect the whole way through. Roll sound. We're watching the movie in 3D as we make it. Oh, that looks so good. You almost feel like you're in it. <laughs> a lot of people have an image of 3D being big and cumbersome, and that's true but we've got a lot of different rigs that we've built for different purposes. It's actually easier in this weird 3D world to have different camera systems for different uses. So this is a camera that we built to go on a crane that can move around and it never comes off the crane. This is the, the TS5 in a handheld mode. It's our main workhorse camera. It's light, it's small, so it allows Peter to get into very tight, narrow corridors and caves as if he would with a, a 2D camera. Oh, yes, yes, yes. You know, mobile camera work has always been very important for the films that I've made, and the last thing I wanted to do when we went to 3D was to restrict or change the shooting style. So with the camera doing the help as well, yeah. you, you don't need me to do much of it. It was very important for The Hobbit that we feel like the same filmmakers have gone back into Middle Earth to tell a new story. We're shooting at the same speed as you'd shoot 2D. Dolly's cranes, steady cam, we put it on the shoulder and we shoot handheld. The same as we would always shoot a movie. Of course, once you've got three or four cameras for main unit, you need three or four cameras for second unit, which is eight cameras, which is really 16 cameras. This is the world of the Hobbit camera department. We have 48 Red Epic cameras, and they're on 17 3D rigs. This one's called Walter, which was my grandfather. This one's Ronald, my uncle. Emily was Fran's grandmother. Perkins was actually Fran's dog. Witchy Poo, Frank, Bill is my dad. Fergus is the name of one of our pugs. Tricky Woo, that's the name of uh, Pekingese. Stan is another one of our pugs. There's cameras called John and Paul, George and Ringo, who are not relations of mine. So are we having fun? Yay! We're not shooting film, we shoot digitally. We shoot onto these cards, which slot in the side of the camera. And each one of these is 128 gig. On top of that, you're shooting at 5K resolution. A very sharp, clear image. It needs like a chart, but uh, you know, like 5K's there, 4K's about there, and then you're 1080, 
home TV is down here, so it gives you sort of an idea of the amount of information that we're actually capturing on these. Let's do another one of those. 48 frames, yes. Yep. We're shooting The Hobbit at a higher frame rate, at 48 frames per second, which is twice the normal 24 frames. The human eye sees 60 frames a second, so 48 frames is more of a natural progression toward giving the, the viewer what they would actually see in the real world. The people who have seen scenes of The Hobbit at 48 frames a second often say that it's like the, the back of the cinema has had a hole cut out of it where the screen is and you're actually looking into the real world. Once you add stereo and it gives you that, that extra ability to control depth, you can devise ways in which um, it can become part of the storytelling of the film. For instance, in Mirkwood, we really play on the fact that it's a forest that's kind of hallucinogenic almost. It draws you in, it makes you part of it, and you may never get out. What we want is just to stay where you are and then... Stay back! Stay where you are! Milkwood is a big forest and it's full of vines and sinister looking trees I suppose you say. It has a lot of things hanging down, a lot of things coming from all sorts of angles and it helps us with the 3D to be able to, to push into that and try and get the audience to feel that they're actually trying to move into the forest with the cameras and give it that dark and look over your shoulder feeling. Colour wise with the red camera it tends to eat colour a little and so we add more colour. If you look at the ungraded footage the trees look incredibly psychedelic. They look like they were painted in 1967. We wouldn't normally be quite as bold as this, even in Mirkwood, which is an enchanted forest, so it's like we oversaturate. Look! In the movie, they won't look anything like that. They'll be graded down and you'll just get the barest hint of colour in the finished film. They're coming back! 3D 48 frames is pretty unforgiving and we have to change our whole way to go about colouring these things because what we found out in early tests that if there wasn't enough red in, in these pieces, they would punch up yellow and react differently than normal skin with blood running through it. So here's an example. This is Graham McTavish as Dwalin, and um, we've had to uh, add a lot of red, red tones to his makeup. So if you notice, if you stick your hand up next to your face, how incredibly pale this man is right now. I've barely seen daylight for the last six months, that's fine. Yes. So we have to add the blood in the piece to make him look like a normal flesh tone. It looks freaky now, but on, on film it's going to read beautifully. Fingers crossed. With the 3D HD stuff, it is amazing how when people's hair moves around on the wigs, it has to actually be the real thing. It has to be real hair. And you find because the number of frames a second you're using and so on and so forth, if you've got real hair moving around, it just looks real. I've never worked on a film that's 48 frames per second and uses the cameras that we're using. It's challenging to look for fabrics that work. I know full well that a fabric that we bought ages ago for a dressing gown for Bilbo would probably make people feel sick if they saw it on camera. It's got spots on it with a little spot inside it and it would just be like someone throwing stones at your face, I think. So I've avoided that fabric like the plague. It's in very poor taste! <laughs> Others are just a joy to behold, and the camera picks it up, and the audience could see every last detail. So, in that sense, it's really exciting. This film is really breaking new grounds in many ways as far as the technology of the filming goes. But John and I are still working in our time honored methods of pencil and charcoal, composing pictures in 2D. And we thought we'd try and come up with some way of actually incorporating a 3D aspect into the way that we were producing the concept art that might communicate more clearly to Peter and to the other technicians. So what we're doing is two drawings. One is in red, one is in blue, and the 3D glasses have a red lens and a blue lens, one for each eye. Uh, don't, don't go too heavy. This is probably the first serious cinema production where the actual concept art has been done in 3D. Rather than sharing just the same office, we're actually sharing basically the same vision. Vision, yeah. There's been a bit of a tendency for me to take on the blue. And obviously, you know, sitting on the right-hand side of the picture, it's easier to actually get your head around the left side. It doesn't make sense when you try and explain it like that. It's a huge help for Peter because we're actually proposing the full depths. I mean, it means Peter has to wear glasses when he looks at our art, but... Yeah. My God, coming at you, look at that. Whoa! If you happen to have a pair of glasses like these at home, you should be able to see the artwork in 3D. You look great. Very three-dimensional. 
you've definitely improved. I, I know. So I hope you found this blog interesting. I know it's a little frustrating because just about everything we've been talking about you can't actually see at the moment. You can't see the 3D, you can't see the 48 frames, you can't see the 5K, but you will. Um, December 2012, you'll finally get a chance to see what we've been talking about. Anyway, I've got to get back to set. It looks like they're almost ready for me down there. We're actually shooting today, as you can see, in a pine forest, but it's not really a pine forest. It's a uh, polystyrene and plaster pine forest. But very shortly, we're going to be leaving the studio and moving on to locations for a few months. So the next time we see you will be from a location somewhere in New Zealand. Catch up with you soon.